instead of a hard night on the wisdom of Ramadan. Uh, so before we start, uh, as usual, we request uh, to adhere to our house rules. First, uh, do keep your mic and video turned off as not to disrupt the sessions. Secondly, we would like to request for you to refrain from asking admin questions. You can do so by asking me directly instead. For those who want to join the WhatsApp group or Telegram groups for the classes information, can do so by the links that we will send you shortly in the chat box. The PowerPoint will be sent in the groups as well. Um, and also, I would like to um, reiterate that for the WhatsApp groups are for those who haven't joined the uh, any of our WhatsApp group before. Uh, so for new sisters, basically. Um, and with regards to recordings, you can see them from the Facebook page. Uh, so do please check the links that I will send in the chat box. For any questions, you can type them also in the chat and we will take those only relating to the topic today. If time permits, we will try to answer them as best as we can at the end of the session. Okay, so to begin our session today, uh, I invite Sister Zikra Zakenaik, who will be talking about the topic of forgiveness in this uh, Blessed Ramadan month. Tafatul, Sister. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Fa'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Dear sisters, I welcome you all with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, I'll be speaking on the topic. Will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me? We as human beings have a natural tendency to err. But Allah Azza wa Jal is the most forgiving. He forgives our shortcomings when we turn back to him and repent. However, sometimes we get so caught up in the multitude of our own sins that we wonder, will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually forgive me? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Tahreem, verse number 8, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha Asa rabbukum an yukaffira ankum sayyiatikum wa yudakhilakum jannatin wa tajri min tahtiha al-anhar O you have believed? Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with sincere repentance. Perhaps your Lord will remove from you your misdeeds and admit you into gardens beneath which rivers flow. If you have the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you have the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if that is what you are seeking, then it shows that you are concerned about, about your bond with him and that you truly believe in him. Why would you ask for forgiveness from Allah? if you did not believe in him? Why would you ask for forgiveness if you, were, if you were not concerned about your Jannah? Seeking forgiveness goes to show that you have a worry about the hereafter. It shows that you are a true mu'min and that you have Iman. To return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after a sin is actually a sign that you are a true believer. Once a man asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is Iman? To which he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, إِذَا سَرَّتْكَ حَسُنَتُكْ وَسَاءَتْكَ سَيِّئَتُكْ فَأَنْتَ مُؤْمِنُ When your good deed makes you happy and your bad deed makes you sad, it is a sign that you are a true believer. So your link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is strengthened 
when you seek forgiveness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never ever reject that tawbah. He will never reject your repentance as long as you are genuine and as long as you are sincere. You know, people come to us and say, please forgive me. And you might say, yeah, okay, it's fine, it's okay. Then they do the same thing, then, uh, then they do the same thing the next time. And they say the same thing. No, please forgive me. So, you know, okay, no problem. Then they do it the third time. It's like, hey, who are you playing with here? This is now the third time. Then you'd say, okay, this is the last time. But if once again they repeat the mistake and come to you saying, please forgive me, you know, you'd say, you know, what is the sister? How do you expect me to keep on forgiving you for a mistake you keep repeating? But I tell you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I promise you, if you are sincere and genuine, you promise not to repeat a sin. And if somehow later on that sin is repeated due to the human nature, due to our weakness, due to shaitan's plot or plan, don't lose hope. Go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Flee to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seek forgiveness again and promise him again that you're not going to do it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. Not once, not twice, but a million times, over and over again. But on the condition that when you are asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness and you, you sincerely intend not to repeat the sin. When you ask Allah's forgiveness, you must say, never again, Ya Allah. I'm not going to repeat this ever again. No, you can't say, oh Allah, I committed this sin. I admit it. I regret it. I ask you to forgive me. I won't commit it. I won't do it again. But then you stop for a moment and say, Allah, I might just do it again. Astaghfirullah. That's not how it works. We have to be sincere in our intention when we turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, we have to have hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will indeed forgive us. Let's not fall into the trap of the devil by thinking that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive us. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it clearly in the Quran, in a verse that is considered the verse with the most amount of hope in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 53, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, go and tell the people. When Allah says قُلْ it means he is giving Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a message, a message to deliver. So Allah is saying, you are the messenger to deliver the following. Say, O my servants, who have transgressed against themselves by sinning, لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله. Do not despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, Allah forgives all sins. Indeed, it is he who is the forgiving, the merciful. Well, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Asrafu ala anfusihim, who have transgressed against themselves by sinning. They have gone beyond the limit against themselves. Because when we sin, it doesn't affect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we sin, it affects us. That's what happens. And here is the first chapter when he makes you think, that when you have committed a sin, I've committed the sin too many times. And you know, therefore it's over. There's no hope for me. It's like I'm gone, I'm doomed. But this is exactly when you have to rise back stronger and make your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala firm. And remind yourself that no, it's not over yet. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, man lazim al istighfar جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ مِنْ كُلِّ ضَيْقٍ مِنْ كُلِّ ضِيقٍ مَخْرَجًا وَمِنْ كُلِّ هَمٍ فَرَجًا وَرَزَقَهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if anyone constantly seeks pardon from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will appoint for him a way out of every distress and a relief from every anxiety and will provide sustenance for him from where he did not expect. This narration is one that brings hope in the heart of every sinner. Thus, we need to repeatedly remind ourselves that no matter what, we must never despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is waiting for us to turn back to him, even though he جل, doesn't need me and you. He is Ar-Rahman, the exceedingly merciful, the unimaginably merciful, the incredibly merciful, the immediately merciful. And once you turn back to him in sincere repentance, he will definitely forgive all of your and my sins. This is what you receive in return for tawbah. Turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Acknowledge your sins and he azza wa jal will accept you. I would like to remind you all of a gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants those who repent and strive hard to seek. What is that? When one asks for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has achieved three great blessings. And every blessing out of these three are better than the world and everything in it. The first being is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided this individual and made him turn back to him and repent. And verily, this is the blessing. Imagine if he had died before seeking repentance for his sin. What would his state have been? What would the angels have told him in the grave? What would be his abode? But no, alhamdulillah, that he corrected himself and asked for repentance. Alhamdulillah, that Allah Azza wa Jal kept him alive till he was able to turn back to his Lord. The second blessing is that if he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of his sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will gather all the sins that this person has committed and will convert them to good deeds. Yes, every sin is converted to a good deed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah, uh, Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 70, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Except for those who repent, believe, and do righteous work, for them Allah Azza wa Jal will replace their evil deeds with, with good deeds. فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace their evil deeds with good ones and ever is Allah forgiving and most merciful. Whereas the third and the last blessing, and it is the best amongst them all, what is it? It is that Allah the Almighty, the greatest, the Lord of the worlds, will be happy with you. Yes, he is happy with you if you turn back to him and seek his forgiveness. And the happiness of Allah Azza wa Jal when a slave turns back to him is greater than the happiness of the slave after he seeks repentance. When in fact, we slaves are the ones who are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in chapter number 35 verse number 15, Ya ayyuha nasu anatumu al-fuqara'u ila Allah, wallahu huwa al-ghaniyu al-hameed. O oh mankind, you are those in need of Allah, while Allah is the free of need, the praiseworthy. But the one who wants to seek his forgiveness should be smart while asking for his forgiveness. He should not leave any bad deed except that he has sought forgiveness from it. For there are many who, when they seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they do not erase all of their sins. How so? For example, some people commit a specific sin for a certain number of years. So let's take the example of watching the haram. If someone was into watching the haram 
And after a while, you know, maybe days or months, he said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's repentance from it. He didn't seek Allah's repentance immediately. He delayed the tawbah. Many think that by this tawbah, all of the sins and bad deeds have been erased. No. All have not been erased. Why? Because now the requirement is not just seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the sin, but one has to seek forgiveness from the sin as well as the delaying of repentance. Because seeing the haram is a sin and delaying tawbah is another sin. So when we seek repentance from the former, we shouldn't forget the latter. And this is a minute detail we shouldn't forget. And there's an amazing solution, a solution we can implement every night and it would help us and aid us, especially on the day of judgment. That is, do not forget to make a general repentance for all of your sins daily. And try to seek this repentance being earnest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being sincere to him with all your heart for all the sins you've committed. In a sense, committed knowingly or unknowingly, whether we remember them or do not remember them, whether major or minor. The important point here is that we seek forgiveness from all the sins. And that we do this tawbah regularly, every day on a daily basis. And if you did that, and you happen to do that every night, then inshallah, you would not even have a single sin on your record. And this tawbah would erase all of your sins. Any sin you regretted it, admitted it, and sought forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and decided never to return to it, then inshallah Allah azza wa jal will forgive you. But there's one kind that would not enter in this tawbah. There's one kind of sin. It is the sins that involve the rights of people. These sins for them to be erased, just tawbah won't suffice. Rather, this involves ret returning the rights of people along with tawbah. So, for example, if someone has wrongfully taken the money of someone else, in this case, only tawbah won't do. The money that has been taken has to be returned. Why? Because Allah is the most merciful, the most beneficent. He will let go of his rights if you turn to him in repentance. But as for man on the day of judgment, he will not leave us and have mercy on us. If a son is going to run away from his mother and father, then what about the rest? So let's be very careful when it comes to the rights of people. And if one does have rights of others and has not paid it back, then on the day of judgment, the only currency that would pay it back would be good deeds. Yes, the oppressed will take from the oppressor good deeds according to his level of oppression. And what if the oppressor doesn't have any good deeds? What would happen then? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take the bad deeds of the oppressed and place it in the scales of the oppressor. Just imagine this, sister, that's so scary. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Now I'd like to ask you all, do you all think that tawbah is just one rank? It's just one kind? No. Tawbah is of three ranks. And the difference between each rank is like the difference between the heavens and the earth. The first kind of tawbah is the tawbah of the general masses, the general people. The second is the tawbah of the chosen ones. Whereas the third is the tawbah of the specially, specifically chosen ones. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hum Allah. They are varying degrees in the sight of Allah. What is the difference between these three categories? The difference is that the first kind of tawbah, it is of the general people. It is tawbah for the sins and evil actions 
So for example, repentance for lying, backbiting, slandering. This is the tawbah of the general category. And these are the people whose bad deeds will inshallah be converted to good deeds. This is the first level. Then there's a tawbah of a higher level than the first one. Tawbah of the chosen ones. And this level of tawbah is not wajib, it's not compulsory, but rather it is mustahab, which means it is encouraged. And this is when the slave seeks forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for leaving the mustahabbat the encouraged acts of worship. So for example, he seeks forgiveness for skipping, for skipping the tahajjud, the night prayer, or for not reciting the adhkar, or skipping the sunnah rawatib, the 12 prayers. This is the tawbah of the chosen ones. And this tawbah is not because the slave committed a sin. No but rather it's because he slackened in performing a recommended act of worship. He felt remorseful because he left or skipped something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And thus he sought forgiveness for that. So if the slave did it, he is rewarded for it. If he did not do it, there's nothing upon him. Therefore it is the tawbah of the chosen ones. And then, there's a still much higher rank of tawbah. You know, one might say higher than this. One did the obligatory as well as the recommended acts of worship. What more can one seek forgiveness from? Yes, the highest level of tawbah. The greatest level a slave can reach while making tawbah. And that is seeking repentance from the mubah acts. That is the permissible acts. So his acts are all only good deeds and there's no room for any makruh or haram act. One may say that the permissible acts are not haram. Then why should I seek forgiveness from it? Who said that tawbah was only for the haram or the makruh acts? But is there any way that we can perform the mubah, that is the permissible acts, and get reward of the mustahab, that is the recommended acts? Yes, definitely. And that is by focusing on our niyyah. That is our intention. So if you want to do any mubah act, get your intentions right. That is you're doing so and so solely to improve your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example, when you eat, make your intentions that you're eating so that you would be able to stand strong in salah in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you don't eat, you would not be able to concentrate in your salah. Then, for example, when you sleep, don't just go to bed without any intention. Seven to eight hours without any good deed or reward, that's a loss, right? So set your intentions right that if I sleep well, only then I'll be able to read my adhkar well in the morning. Only then I'll be able to pray fajr salah with khushur. For verily, only the smart ones would be able to grab hold of these rewards with, with such ease. Also, another important point to make here is that the other regular acts that we do, the acts of worship, we can gain in those rewards by improving our own intentions. So for example, when you stand for salah, we can have the intention to have the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to follow his commandments, to follow, the, to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To avoid the hellfire. To practice khushur. To purify the heart. To revise our Quran and so on and so forth. For example, fasting. To attain the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To follow his commandments. To attain taqwa. To keep away from the hellfire. To enter paradise through Babur Rayyan to fight desires, to hasten in breaking the fast, to have our breath more fragrant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than musk. So all of these intentions would increase in our reward bi And this is by focusing on our niyyah, that is our intention. 
And the best part is that purifying one's intentions is something very easy. Does anyone get tired purifying one's intentions? No, it's easy. We are anyways doing the act, right? But the point is we have to remember to set our intentions straight. And what exactly are the conditions for Tawbah? What is it that can help one attain the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Firstly, the need to admit the sin. We have to accept the fact that we are at fault. Second comes regret. And thirdly, turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in sincere repentance and promising him never to do it again. When you do something wrong, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately. Promise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never again, Allah. I won't do it again. No, we are humans. We do falter. We do fall. But at the same time, we have to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and plan never to commit again, never to commit the sin again. And if these conditions are met, any sin between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be wiped out. Wiped out without never being mentioned again. When you repent again from the same sin, that second repentance is now repenting from a sin that no longer existed. So what it does is that it elevates your status in, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To say this person is still concerned about something that I've already forgiven a long time ago. It shows that they love me. It shows that they worship me and me alone. So it is an elevation of our status. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, chapter number three, verse number 135. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَمْ يُصِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ And those who when they commit an immorality or wrong themselves by transgression, they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek forgiveness for their sins. وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And who can forgive sins except Allah Azza wa Jal? And who do not persist in what they have done while they know? So let's hasten. Let's not delay. If we delay, we have no guarantee if we will live the next few days or no. We do not know when our time would be up. Let's repent now before it's too late. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a chance to live this blessed month of Ramadan. So when is it a better time than this blessed month of Ramadan? To hasten to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in repentance. Now if I was to ask, why does one need to repent? We need to understand that, that there are two kinds of people. A, those who quit sinning because they fear Allah and they fear the hellfire. That's number one. Whereas number two, those who quit sinning because they love Allah Azza wa Jal, so out of their love for the most merciful, they quit sinning. And this is a higher level, a much higher level than the first one. Let's look at the example of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He did not have the need to seek for forgiveness. However, he put forth, how many times did he ask for forgiveness? <clears throat> he said, <clears throat> Wallahi inni la astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi fil yawm akthar min sab'ina marra. By Allah, <clears throat> I ask for forgiveness from Allah and turn to him in repentance more than 70 times a day. How many times a day do we seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Sincere forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did it more than 70 times a day. And he didn't even have the need to do it. And we need it. And sadly, we don't do it. Astaghfirullah wa tubu May Allah forgive all of us. We need to strengthen ourselves to do what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and try it. So try it with your salah. And check how you feel. 
and do it solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you stand for salah, stand with focus. Try to understand what you're reading. Have a feeling of hope and excitement, a feeling of raja when you stand for salah. This feeling that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all of my sins. And be confident that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you from his mercy, from his rahmah. Be confident that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will repair me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer my duas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will draw me near to him. I have this feeling that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not let me down. And the more you know him, the more hope you will have in him. And you will yearn for his meeting in salah. You're meeting with the Lord who has every good you aspire for. Coming to Salah with the feeling that Allah will erase all of your minor and major sins. And by doing all of these, you will inshallah increase your khushu in your Salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu yuridu an yatuba alaykum. Allah azza wa jal wants to forgive you. So it's the feeling that I love Allah. I know I'm weak, but I'm seeking his forgiveness. I'm going to try my best to do what he wants me to do. I know it's not easy, but I'm going to try my best. And that is where the concept of real tawbah comes in. When things go wrong in our life, let's, let, let's seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine your buddy is with the richest person. And if you need something, he would give it to you straight away, right? But if not, then it would be a problem. So you and I, the best thing to do right now is to become buddies with the owner of the heavens and the earth, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to create a strong bond with him. How does that come about? You need to try to get closer to him. It's mentioned in a hadith, a Lord who is blessed and exalted descends every night to the lowest heaven when the last one third of the night remains and says, who supplicated me so that I may answer him? Who asks of me so that I may forgive him? Who asks of me so that I may give him? Do we truly seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every day? We have to, sisters. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, At-ta'ibu min al-dhamb kaman la dhambala. The one who repents from sin is like the one who did not sin. Subhanallah. Isn't that amazing? In the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, by him in whose hand is my life, if you were not to commit a sin, Allah azza wa jal would sweep you out of existence and he would replace you by those people who would commit sin and then seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have pardoned them. In conclusion, sisters, let's remind ourselves the Lord who saved Noah alayhi salam from the flood and saved Musa alayhi salam from drowning in the depths of the sea and who commanded the water to be cool for Ibrahim alayhi salam. He is the same Lord you and I worship. Thus, let's never give up. Never despair and never let shaitan overpower you. Instead, remind yourself that your Lord is the one whose mercy encompasses all things. Allahumma taqabbal tawbatana, waghsil hawbatana, warfa' maqamana indak, wajma'ana tahta dhillik yawma la dhilla illa dhillik. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-jannah, Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-jannah, Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-jannah wa na'udhu bika min al-nar. Wa salli allahumma wa sallim ala nabiyyina Muhammad, wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. for a humbling reminder for us to repent and ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
Oh Lord, we have wronged ourselves, and if you do not forgive us and have mercy upon us, we will surely be among the losers. Allahumma inna ka'afun to hibbul afwa ba'fu anin. Oh Allah, indeed you are pardoning and you love to pardon, so pardon you. All right, so for the next um, speaker, we will invite Sister Ratibah Mehek for um, her topic on Ramadan of the Salaf. Tafadah, Sister Ratibah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The topic of today's talk is Ramadan of the Salaf الحمد لله The month of Ramadan The month of mercy and forgiveness The month of blessings The month of the Quran the month in which Laylatul Qadr resides, and much more has arrived. And we are grateful to Allah that he chose us to witness this month once again. Alhamdulillah. Ramadan is so special compared to the other months. We know that during this month, the rewards are multiplied. Every form of worship, every act of kindness, and every good deed done during this month carries more weight and blessings. Allah's mercy and generosity are showered upon us in this month. The gates of forgiveness are open. The gates of heaven are opened and the gates of hell are closed. All prayers are heard. And let's not forget Laylatul Qadr, a night that has more blessings and is better than a thousand months, the night of power. With so much on offer, Ramadan is certainly a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, it is more than a gift. It's a bundle of opportunities to purify our souls, to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to forgive and seek forgiveness. So it is upon us Muslims to make use of this blessed month and benefit from it. That's how the Salaf radiallahu anhum were when they entered this month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan was like no other month for them. They treated it differently. They multiplied their acts of worship in this month because they were aware that the rewards that were prom promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are multiplied. They would prepare themselves as early as up to six months in advance for this month and would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Allahumma balighna Ramadan. O oh Allah, let us reach the month of Ramadan. They would make this dua with the desire in their hearts to reach this month. Fasting in the month of Ramadan for the Salaf was not only about abstaining oneself from food and drink. This was the easiest and most fundamental part of Ramadan. They had a deeper understanding of what they should do in this golden month. And, and they would abstain from anything that would distract their acts of worship. They would abstain from everything that was impermissible and perform acts of worship that got them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu an used to say, "Ida sumta fal yasum sam'uka wa basaruka wa lisanuka an al kadhib wal maharim." When you fast, let your ears, eyes, and tongue fast from lying and that which is impermissible, and stop annoying your neighbors. And when you fast, it should be seen as your fasting, and do not make the day that you fast and the day that you do not fast the same. The Salaf used to not only fast from food and drink, but they also protected their eyes from seeing that which was haram. Their ears and tongues from acts that are haram, such as backbiting and slandering. They would also maintain good relations with the people around them, their neighbors and their family members. In addition to that, they strived hard to make sure their character and their acts of worship during these days, they were uh, the, the days they were fasting, were more significant from the days they weren't. Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, uh, he quoted in his book, Lataif al-Ma'arif, regarding the saying, if I indulge my ears and my eyes in its desires when fasting, 
then the only reward that awaits my fasting are hunger and thirst. And if I then claim that I fasted, know that it is as though I haven't. Meaning that the true essence of fasting is not just in staying away from food and drink. It is in being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having taqwa, staying away from sins, protecting our eyes, ears, tongues, and limbs from all that is haram, and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 183, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum al-siyam, kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum, la'allakum tattakul. O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you that you may acquire taqwa. It was narrated from Abu Huraira radiallahu an that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there are people who fast and get nothing from their fast except hunger. And there are those who pray and get nothing from their prayer but a sleepless night. May Allah protect us from being like those who get nothing from their fast except hunger. Who waste time during this blessed month or sleep all day? Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says, from the matters that corrupt the heart are eating to one's fill, excessive sleep, excessive socializing, wishful thinking, and attachment to others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. Ibn Rajab uh, al-Hamali uh, rahimahullah, he also mentions that the Salaf they used to exert all their efforts in performing righteous deeds, perfecting them and excelling in them. The, accept, the acceptance of their good deeds would be a huge concern for them, for they feared that their efforts would not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only would they make dua six months in advance so that they are able to reach Ramadan, they made dua even six months after Ramadan in hopes that Allah would accept their ibadah and their good deeds. And the trait of the Salaf during the month of Ramadan was that the Quran used to be their best friend. They would not leave the Quran out of their sight. They would hold on to the Quran just as how we hold on our, uh, our phones today. And they would finish reading it multiple times in a month. Their recitations of the Quran were not just recitations, they were coupled with understanding and contemplation. The great Tabi'i, Ibrahim al-Nakhri, uh, rahimahullah, he used to complete reading the Quran every two days during the last 10 nights of Ramadan. And during the first 20 days, he would complete it every three nights. Qatada, rahimahullah, he used to complete re reading the Quran on a normal month every seven days. But during the month of Ramadan, he would finish it every three days. And during the last 10 nights, he would finish it every single night. This shows their relationship with the Quran. We should emulate their ways to the best of our capabilities, my dear sisters. A small yet powerful tip in trying to follow and emulate the Salaf is to spend less time on our phones or take a break from the social media accounts during the month of Ramadan and concentrate solely on the, on the Quran. Another trait of the Prophet وسلم, and the Salaf was that they were extremely generous. In Ramadan, the Prophet وسلم, he was known to be the most generous of men. It is stated in the hadith narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas عن, where he says, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أجود الناس وكان أجود ما يكون في رمضان. The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم was the most generous of men. And he was the most generous during the month of Ramadan. Meaning that he was the most generous of men usually in the, during the other months. But during the month of Ramadan, he was more generous than he was usually. This was then followed by the Salaf by increasing their acts of charity with their wealth during this blessed month. The Salaf used to go the extra mile in search for orphans, widows, and those in need so that they could give charity and a helping hand. Another thing the Prophet وسلم, and the Salaf would do is that they would pr provide iftar to a fasting person. The Prophet وسلم, he says in a hadith, 
كان له مثل أجره غير أنه لا ينقص من أجر الصائم شيئا He who provides a fasting person something with which to break his fast will earn the same reward as the one who was observing the fast without diminishing in any way the reward of the latter. Meaning that the person who would provide iftar to another fasting person, he would get the reward of that fasting person without the reward of him being, redu being reduced. They would provide iftar to someone every single day, one person or more which most of us try to do in Ramadan, alhamdulillah. This was from the Sunnah of the Prophet But we should take care that we do not overeat. Because most of the time, most of us, we overeat after iftar and feel lazy to stand for taraweeh and to do other ibadah. That is not the objective, objective of eating, my dear sisters. Imam Abdul Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says, from the matters that corrupt the heart are, eating to one's fill, eating a lot. How do you expect to attain the objectives of fasting, the objective of attaining taqwa when your heart is corrupt? Allah has obligated fasting upon us in Ramadan in order to attain taqwa. We are meant to eat and sleep only that much which we require to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to strengthen ourselves for ibadah and other daily activities. Anything more than that is not required. With regards to Qiyamul Layl, prolonging night prayers during the month was a normal practice of the Salaf. Aisha radiallahu anha, she used to say that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would pray his night prayer the most during the month of Ramadan. And Umar, Umar radiallahu anha used to tell Ubay ibn Ka'ab and Tamim al-Dari radiallahu anhuma to stand for the night prayer in congregation during this month. And the Imam, he used to recite more than 200 pages in each rakah. The Salaf would also do i'tikaf in the mosque, especially in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, like how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he advised that those who do i'tikaf should not mix around with people in the midst of it. The allocated time should be invested in the Quran, dhikr, seeking Allah's forgiveness and other acts of worship. One year, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Ramadan, he did i'tikaf for the first 10 nights. After those 10 days, those 10 nights, the first 10 nights of Ramadan were over, he was about to leave. When Jibreel Alayhi Salam came to him and told him, wait, Laylatul Qadr has not occurred yet. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stayed again for the next 10 nights. Now after 20 days were over, 20 days of spending in i'tikaf, he was about to leave when Jibreel السلام, came to him again and told him, Laylatul Qadr has not occurred yet. So he stayed in i'tikaf for the next 10 nights. That is for the whole month of Ramadan to seek one night of Laylatul Qadr, which is khayrun min alf shahr. It is better than a thousand months. It is not equal to a thousand months, but better than thousand a thousand months of ibadah. It is better than 83 years of ibadah, a whole lifespan, subhanAllah. It is an opportunity not to be missed. If you attain Laylatul Qadr every year of your life, imagine that fadl and that barakah you will attain. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, seek it in the last 10 nights of the, Ramadan, of, of the month of Ramadan. But we find that during the odd nights, the masajid are full and everybody is trying their best to seek Laylatul Qadr. But during the even nights, we are lazy or we do not do much. That's not how the Salaf were. Rather, every night of the last 10 nights, they treated it like Laylatul Qadr. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says, if you go wrong, and start Ramadan on a wrong night, and the odd nights you think are actually even nights, and even nights you think are actually odd nights, then what happens? There is a big problem, right? You miss Laylatul Qadr. So that's why every single night matters. You do not waste a single night of the last 10 nights. You do that 
When you do that, you definitely attain Laylatul Qadr. The Salaf, radiallahu anhum, they also made sure that they call their family members and those around them towards this khair. They would not just do it themselves. They would call others, invite their family members, their friends and their neighbors towards the khair so that they are also benefiting from Ramadan. And we are meant to do the same so that our family and those around us are also successful in Ramadan. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in a hadith, Man sama Ramadan, whoever fasts during Ramadan, in another hadith it says, Man qama shahra Ramadan, imanan wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambih. Wa man qama laylat al-qadri imanan wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambih. Whoever spends the nights of Ramadan in prayer, in qiyam, out of faith and in hope of the reward, he will be forgiven his previous sins. And whoever spends the night of Laylatul Qadr in prayer, out of faith and in the hope of reward, he will be forgiven his previous sins. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who are successful in Ramadan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. I ask Allah to accept our repentance our good deeds, our ibadah, our qiyam, and our fasting. I ask Allah to make us from those who attain Laylatul Qadr, imanan wa ihtisaba. I ask Allah to make us from the Ahlul Quran. I ask Allah to increase us in, not, in knowledge and in guidance. And I ask Allah, just like he united us here today, to unite us in Jannatul Firdaus. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakila Khaira, Sister Atiba, for a motivation, motivating session. Uh, may we strive to perform our Ramadan to the best of our abilities, like this, like the Prophet Wasallam and the Salam. So, moving on, uh, we will invite Ustada Farhat Naik uh, with her topic on the wisdom of Ramadan. The Father Ustada. Nahmaduhu Nusali Alla Rasulihil Karim and Mabad, Fauzu Bilan in a Shaitan Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Ya Yohal Ladina, Manu Putiva, Lakumusia, Mukama Putiva, Lazina Min Kobli Kumla, Lakum Tatakun. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Rubbish Rahli Sadri, Vasili, Amri, Wahlun Ukta, Milisani of Kokoli. My beloved sisters, in Deen, I welcome you with the greetings of peace and mercy. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May the peace, mercy, and the choicest blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon you. I hope and I pray all of you are doing well, my dear sisters. In the best state of Iman and trying to grab the mercy and the rahmah and the blessings of this great blessed month. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. So yeah, picking up from what we left last time, uh, spreading the attitude of gratitude, spreading the spirit of gratitude, remembering the earthquake victims that we, you know, thought of last time, discussed in detail, how we have to be so, so, so very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for another chance of Ramadan. So we beg Allah to be amongst, to be counted amongst the Shakirin. We spread shukar, uh, not in a boastful way, but in a grateful way, in a humble way. Pama bi ni'amati rabbi ka fahaddis. Uh, reflecting upon the last 10 days, almost 10, 11 days have gone. A third of Ramadan is almost over, my dear sisters. We need to remind ourselves what an incredible month we are in, which has, which, which brings with itself amazing benefits. Uh, and we've just heard of the marvels of Ramadan in the earlier two talks also. And it's a time and a place for transformation. 
how we need to uh, you know do our best and and make the best every moment of this period this time zone this blessed time zone that we are in uh, so it, ramadan in its very essence is it's it is you know the month of the heart the month of the soul which is meant to purify and uh, it is a month with uh, to summit all you know a month of little food little drink and little sleep putting off all the unnecessary getting rid of the lahu and the lagu unnecessary speech frivolous idle wasteful uh, activities waste of time all negativity we have to get rid of and try to reach higher and higher the more we bow down in sujood and qiyam the we, the more we beg allah subhanahu wa taala to raise us higher and higher and draw uh, us higher in our akhlaq in our thinking in positivity so much so that allah is pleased with us so last time we discussed the three levels of uh, of fasting sisters are you with me you all remember the three levels of fasting we discussed last time just a glimpse again we go back to the three levels uh, level 1 is leaving the permissible food and drink okay the next level is the impermissible and the haram things also we leave and then another level is leaving behind what is otherwise as muba that is not too much socializing uh, so willfully and purposefully minimizing all the other activities which also fall into the muba category right so that so that we can focus on our spiritual transformation so that we can connect to allah in a stronger way like let me give you an example of that like for instance if uh, you know generally if somebody asks you how are you or if you're meeting a friend uh, and and you know they ask you how are you so maybe you chat for around 30 minutes or 40 minutes but in ramadan we restrict and we restrain ourselves so maybe we can just confine it to 5 minutes because there's so much to be done and every moment has you know so much baraka so we want to capture the baraka ramadan my dear sisters is like the ultimate boot camp so it's like like uh, what what or how do you define a boot camp a boot camp is like a rigorous training to acquire deep skills in a short period of time to train to be, to become better in the future the training is difficult generally you know it it refers to the training training of the army and the soldiers so this also is the same as far as our spirituality is concerned we are all spiritual soldiers right spiritual warriors so to say fighting the army of the shaitan and the nafs so fasting is actually building the spiritual muscle fasting is actually building the inner uh, the inner warrior within us the inner spiritual soldier that is within us therefore it's the spiritual muscle that matters therefore you know if you allow me to call this period of ramadan as a boot camp in which the rigorous training is done so that it so that we emerge out victorious to survive in the 11 months that are to come it's a very prestigious school ramadan and the question is will i graduate from this school successfully will you graduate from this school successfully it's tricky right we all enter but some come out so strong with such strong wings that one can fly the remaining 11 months higher and higher in akhlaq and closer to allah subhanahu wa taala uh, in, in terms of ubudiyah in terms of ibadat you know we grow closer to allah subhanahu wa taala 
So Ramadan for some is like a mercy that comes and a mercy to wash them through and through. While for others, Ramzan comes as a scrub and washes the, washes the dirt, the filth, the grime and the silt that is developed. Yet for others, Ramadan is like a sieve. Asking what you want to choose, whether it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the dunya, whether it's akhira or dunya. Or it could also be a combo, a combination of any of these. Which even if it is, we pray, it's a rain and draws us closer to him. Inshallah. You know, my dear sisters, there are three types of people that enter Ramadan. What are these three types of people? One is, you know, people, uh, people enter the same way and they walk out the same way. So they walk out absolutely empty handed. Hearts untouched, souls unmoved, lives unchanged. These are the people who have already decided that they're going to stop sins only for the month of Ramadan and then they go back. Oh, so it's Ramadan, so it's the, it's, the, it's the time of piety. So I have to stop my sins now and I'll go back to it again. Auzubillah. That's a sorry state of affairs. Then the second kind of people who enter Ramadan are the worst. How so? These are the kind of people, they did fast, yet they do backbiting, they are spiteful with their ill feelings, with the haram earnings, with jealousy, with so many sins, with no tawbah, no salah, even the fard is lost and they are still into haram relationships, constantly on the FB, wasting time, sleeping for hours together, stalking, just into something which is, uh, you know, just whiling away the time because they feel hungry. They just want to waste away the entire time the whole day. So these are the people who enter into Ramadan but walk out in the worst possible way. Now there's a third kind of people who, who are, you know, people who have, who really are raised in their degree in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have risen higher and higher and they are the ones who benefited a lot. And who are these kind of people? They are the ones who have completely changed and transformed. These are the ones who have really taken the boot camp training very well. They are the best. They are those who have excelled in the boot camp training. These are the ones who come into Ramadan but they try their best. They beg to Allah, foremost in seeking forgiveness, foremost in standing out, standing up in the night, foremost in really, genuinely trying to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah make us of these kind of people who strive for the best amongst the three who enter into Islam. Now, moving on, my dear sisters. What are the three important moves that we must do as far as Ramadan is concerned? Three smart moves this Ramadan. Point number one, my dear sisters, is since this is the month of the heart. And the heart is in need of something which is so essential, you know, without which the heart cannot survive. It's like, it's, it's a basic human need, the need of the heart. If we speak about the heart, my dear sisters, our hearts are in need of an ilah a lord, a master, and it must adopt one, as, as is the need of the heart. 
it cannot live without it yes the heart needs to love someone completely so keep that thing in mind and with that in mind we make very strong and conscious efforts of connecting to allah rather falling in love with allah subhanahu wa taala deeply in this month so what is the first move that we make is falling in love with allah now if we reflect my dear sisters in islam all the five pillars of islam it's whether it's salah zakat fasting or hajj rather you know it's not just a it islam is not just about these five pillars that is rather we are expected to be the abd of allah 24/7 right that is our goal to seek the pleasure of allah so ubudiya that is ibada is 24/7 like allah says you sort out the things with me and i will sort out your affairs with everyone else so my dear sisters in this month of the heart we need to consciously willfully graciously connect to allah subhanahu wa taala we need to talk to allah you know whenever there is a problem we turn to allah subhanahu wa taala it's a very personal connection in case when a problem or a calamity or a tragedy or something some ups and downs happen in life we we turn to allah subhanahu wa taala and we cry out our heart isn't it well let me share with you a very personal experience my dear sisters and this is deep you know at times it's a guilt trip that we go on am i coming to my lord only only when there is a problem is this level of khushu is attained only when there is a problem am i crying out to allah only when there is a calamity in my life doesn't allah deserve much more so where is the love is this out of lack of loyalty in fact i have to be grateful to allah subhanahu wa taala that allah pulled me back to him through this calamity right i hope you're getting my point my dear sisters every calamity gifts you with something and the greatest gift that each calamity grants all of us is the fact that we reconnect to allah subhanahu wa taala in a much more stronger way with a healthier bond whatsoever wealth and ease can be a test my dear sisters in fact sahaba used to be worried if the life is all good all the time maybe allah is giving him yet allah hates him and depriving him yet allah loves him and we have the beautiful examples of the extremes in islam for example we have the uh, we have Pharaoh's example he had the best of empire right and then on the other hand we have the example of Ibrahim alay salam a youth who's hunt out of the house almost a pauper hit by the parents hit by the father burned by the community what more right and on the contrary we have the example of the pharaoh king of the kings so to say he had everything at his disposal although that's not a rule again and then we have the other example of suleiman alay salam who had the best of both this world and the akhirah and then we have the example of our beloved the role model the best person who walked the face of this earth prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who faced all the calamities in this life right from lo loss of child loss of wife to just in the month of ramadan it it was not just you know standing up in qiyam and you know eating iftar or just uh, fasting the day it was right from the battle of badr to the to the fateh makkah right from there and the battle after battle it was not just one battle 
but so many battles that were fought in the month of Ramadan. So Ramadan just did not come like, okay, it was a set of qiyam and fasting and standing up late in the night. No. There was so much more in his life that he faced. Not just that. In the battle of Badr itself, the death of the daughter. Imagine. After the battle, he comes back home to hear that he's lost one of his beloved daughters. Subhanallah. So we have the best of examples, my dear sisters. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his divine wisdom, Allah who is al-wadud. You know, let us understand more how does love work as far as ubudiya is concerned. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah has described the various stages of love. Now this he uh, explains is in general also. Okay, any love. Of the opposite gender, it could be of uh, any other people, for, or one can relate it to, to the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, how does this develop? He's divided the love into six stages. And what are these six stages? I'll quickly go through them. Stage one is the stage of alaka. And alaka, we know, is like a leech like substance, right? So, the attachment, like uh, like what the Quran speaks of, when the heart is attached to the beloved out of inclination. The second is the sabaha, which is uh, uh, like an infatuation. When the heart is poured out, feeling butterflies in the stomach. You know, usually when the lovers meet and how they are, they have a strong inclination towards one another. And the third stage is called the the stage of Gharam. Uh, uh, does this word remind you of anything in any of the surahs? Gharam is passionately loving. When the lover never wants to leave the heart. Inna azabaha kana gharama. Gharam is also the word which means indebted to. A person is indebted to, to be caught up in a loan. How you're caught up in a loan and you cannot leave until you don't, you know, uh, uh, repay. And then also gharim is gharama is also uh, fined after doing something wrong. So when the, when, when the lover never leaves the heart, that's the state of gharam. And then the stage four is the ishq. That is the ardent love, usually also used in the Urdu language, right? extreme love compromising on health on sleep on sacrifice anything and everything the lover is willing to do so up till here it's all the generalized general stages this could be the love of anyone whatsoever then level five is tatayum which is which means you know uh, uh, enthralled towards the lover rather completely enslaved whatever the lover says even if the lover uh, says you know to do haram things to rob to steal to to get into haram activities of riba you know just in order to give the gift or just in order to satisfy the lover you do not even uh, distinguish between the right and the wrong do not even decipher whether it's halal income or harar income Haram income, people can kill, murder, do whatever possible. It's to that level, that kind of enslavement. You're literally enslaved to the lover. And then he describes the last stage, that is the stated stage of Ubudiya, that is Ibadah. If all this is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it leads to Ibadah. And what is Ibadah? We know, right? complete and unconditional submission and this is uh, my dear sisters very very empowering so the, so you can say that the the peak of enslavement that is the peak of love and that is ibadah that you know allah i love you so much allah i love you so much that I am ready to, uh, uh, you know, submit myself completely to you, complete and unconditional submission uh, that my physical body also bows down to you in complete submission. 
so you so we are not only just uh, you know spiritually emotionally physically uh, psychologically and by all means you know when we when we are enthralled by enslavement uh, our highest part of the body bows down in sujood to the lowest part of the ground that is complete and unconditional submission now in raudatul muhibbin uh, ibn ibn al jauzi mentions it is haram to love someone so much why because he says it could be very very painful and this is something haram to do for anybody other than allah subhanahu wa taala so we learn my dear sisters never bring anyone equal to your love with allah he doesn't like competitors and if you do so or if i do so we are the ones who suffer the most in order to save us allah will take away that very love from us allah will take away that very love from us allah mentions in chapter 9 verse number 24 kulin kana abaukum wa abnaukum wa ikhwanukum wa shiratukum wa amwalun iktaraftum wa tijaratun takhshawna kasada wa masakin tardawna ahabba ilaykum min allahi wa rasuli wa jihadin fi sabili fatarabbasu hatta yati allahu bi amri wallahu la yadil qaumal fasiqin so in chapter 9 verse number 24 we come to know that whatever it is if we place our children our siblings our parents our spouses the wealth that we have amassed the the businesses in which you fear a decline the beautiful homes our villas our houses our cars our jewelry whatever it is if we love that as much as we should love allah subhanahu wa taala then allah says you wait until allah brings about his destruction unto you and he says he guides not the poverty transgressors so my dear sisters we have to learn a lesson that this month of ramadan is meant to purify us la lakum tattaqun so that we may attain taqwa because taqwa is something which is developed in the heart right so this is the month therefore of the heart we need to take care of the heart it's not just being hungry the whole day and standing up without understanding anything in qiyam rather it's the transformation of our hearts our hearts have to be full of allah subhanahu wa taala like allah mentions in surah baqara wal ladina amanu ashaddu hubban lillah but those who are the true believers they are the ones who are who exceed tremendously in their love for allah subhanahu wa taala so my dear sisters this is very important for us to remember that if we are filling the heart you know in the absence of allah subhanahu wa taala if the heart does not have allah it will seek inferior loves and it will move from one love to the other love looking for comfort each love affair with an inferior lover becomes an episode of pain and disappointment and could leave a person shattered and broken and if the love is unhealthy it could be even even more painful the story can be even more painful and unfortunately my dear sisters we try to fill our hearts all sometimes you know with material things if our hearts are not fed properly with what it needs there is a huge void just like if the physical heart was devoid of blood it will go into a cardiac arrest and die when the spiritual heart is not being fed properly some of 
you know what will happen? The same thing will happen. Some of the contenders are that, that you and I try to fill this huge void with very, naive, very naively and very subtly the physical and the material stuff right from money, wealth, building, dwellings, villa, jewelry, clothes, cars, gadgets, and, and, and the iPhones and the iPads and entertainment and relationships and people and children and friends, both actual and virtual, can't forget how media sells the real heroes replaced with the fake heroes, desires and the nafs. Sadly, the more you fill in it, it's like a bottomless pit bottomless cup more you put in the more you put in the more it seeps out and as a as a result of this as a result of the consequence of this what happens because of the wrong stuff that is filled in the desire to want more and more continues and the void is never filled and it leads to anxiety hurt and depression may allah help us to decipher the true love and the fake and the false attachments. May Allah help us to develop true love in the right sense. And actually, because true love is something that actually empowers, that actually elevates, that strengthens, that capacitates, that uplifts us. And fake love enslaves, it weakens, it denies, it destroys, it demotes. Therefore, this is the time we need to develop the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the first move, my beloved sisters. Now, what is the second move? As far as we know, we are aware that shayateen are locked up in the month of Ramadan, right? We, we are aware, my dear sisters, the Prophet ﷺ told us the gates of heaven are open, the gates of hellfire are closed, and the shayateen are locked. How about locking the shaitan permanently? You know, many sisters, people question why do we still sin if the shayateen are locked? So the question is, are all shayateen locked or only some shackled? The big ones, the more mischievous ones, the masters are locked up, my dear sisters. The small, the small ones, especially the kareem, is still there. So what are the implications of the shayateen being locked? and imprisoned. Some reflections, my dear sisters. You know, firstly, we need to understand and remember that is what Surah Nas says, right? Only you waswisu. They can only tempt us, my dear sisters, only whisper. They do not have control over us. They don't have ownership of you. The choice is yours. If you want to be entertained and allow them, the choice is ours. If we want them to access to our heart, our mind and our thoughts that they seek round the clock, 24-7, day and night. Point number two to reflect is, my dear sisters, Inna naksal amaratu bisu. One of the sisters mentioned rightly, yes, it is the nafs that is there, the evil nafs, the amara. The self commands evil as well. The question is, when does this happen? When there is a void, like I spoke of the void. So the shaitan is able to plant those whispers and desires only if and when it finds a void within you. Right? For example, zikr is the fortress. It repels shaitan away. The penetration is not possible, right? So if you are busy with something beneficial, so you won't be tempted to something so lowly like vain desires, right? 
so when there is a time period in life when there's no purpose and you're just whiling away time that's the time my dear sisters that the shaitan can access into that void so remember we have to build our fortress very strong the connection the zikr the stronger the connection of zikr the more the heart is occupied with allah subhanahu wa taala the lesser will be the impact of the shaitan so the shaitan cannot enter when there is the spiritual oxygen of zikr so how far do we allow this access to the shaitan how far do we allow him to penetrate he can only do it to the extent that we give him the access he can access our good thoughts our good deeds our heart our mind our relationships and our social interactions also our wealth the shaitan can enter into all this the question is how much access are you and i going to give him to find that room to misguide us right so like allah mentions in uh, chapter number 43 verse number 36 allah subhanahu wa taala says if anyone withdraws himself from the remembrance of allah most gracious we appoint for him an evil one to be an intimate companion to him right so it's clear allah is mentioning here that the person who is void of the remembrance of allah now remembrance of allah does not necessarily mean only we are the lip service subhanallah wa bihamdi alhamdulillah not that genuine sincerely remembering allah subhanahu wa taala out of the love and the fear of allah then allah mentions in verse number 37 such an evil one really hinders them from the path but they think that they are being guided aright so you see the mask that the shaitan is wearing and the misunderstanding of the believer believer thinks no it's fine this i am rightly guided auzu billah verse number 38 allah says at length when such a one comes to us he says to his evil companion would that between me and thee were the distance of the east and the west ah oh, evil is the companion indeed that means on the day of judgment when this evil companion you will meet it will be as if he'll say i wish you were far from me like that of the east and the west verse number 39 allah says when you have done wrong it will avail you nothing that day that you shall be partners in punishment so this is the role of the shaitan my dear sisters so when we are ghafil in a state of ghafla that is the time that the shaitan takes over and that's the time he enters he penetrates into our hearts and our minds so what is the fortress that you and i are making the quran is the fortress zikr is the fortress constant adkar is the fortress sometimes loud sometimes slow in our hearts of hearts another important point my dear sisters holding on to the sin only till ramadan ends this is the victory of the shaitan so this boot camp is meant to strengthen us train us and transform us so if one is fully immersed in ibada decides never to go back to the sin again the shaitan insha allah will be permanently locked you want to give him a life sentence not just a month sentence right and we have the example of umar radhiyallahu ta'ala how so determined he was to serve allah that the shaitan would walk the opposite path and that's how he was defeated then alwaswas al khannas the whisper and the sins we want to we want to be we want to be away from all the whispers right if all shayatin are locked then how come we still sin the reason number 1 is that not all of them are locked right only the masters are locked the smaller ones still remain there's also the explanation given for this is that they are locked but that doesn't mean that do, they they do not move they still move so they have a very less impact on the human beings point number 2 is due to bad habits 
or developed over the years. So what happens is that because of the bad habits that people have developed, developed, obviously, you know, the impact of that is still there. And point number three is that minal jinnati vannas, the human devils, there are shayateen in the form of men who take people on the wrong path. So that is also one of the reasons. So may Allah save us and may Allah protect us from all these kind of impacts of the shaitan. You know, my dear sisters, basically it is ghafla. It is heedlessness that leads to waswas. That waswasa which the shaitan comes and they put and he puts. But when we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the zikr that is the fortress. So what is your and my fortress that we are building in this, in this boot camp of Ramadan? Quran, Salah and Zikr, right? So that we can protect ourselves from the shaitan and give a lifelong sentence, lock up the shaitan forever that we will never be able to come back to you with the power and the excess that he had before. Obviously, if you sentence him, he will not have the same impact. He may not be able to penetrate in the same way. Let's make, let's help the shaitan despair in us. Iblis, Ablasa, one who despairs. He despaired in Allah's mercy. He chose the dark path. Let's strive harder to make the shayateen lose hope in, in us. Because you are so focused in pleasing Allah. You and I are so determined in pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's not lose this opportunity of locking the shaitan forever. Let's not allow him to penetrate again into our system, into our bloodstream, into our being. We do not aim only to put away shaitan for a month. Rather, we don't want to give him access to come back to us viciously with more vengeance as he always does. Why? Because as soon as Eid happens, he gets access. No, we are not going to do that this time. We beg Allah to fortify us, inshallah. Right? So we are going to stop sin completely this Ramadan and we are going to try to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, we are going to lock the shaitan forever. And the third move. What is the third move? Third wise move this Ramadan is to capture the Baraka. And this brings me to my next point, my dear sister. Anywhere the shaitan are not there, who are with us? Any guesses? Wherever the shayateen are not there, then who is there with us? In our presence. Who is there, my dear sisters? Very good manas. They are none others but the angels. And it's vice versa. When we do not have angels with us, who is around us? Who, who is with us? It's the shayateen that are with us. And it's ultimately our actions that, deter, that determine who is where. Right? How many angels are around us? Or how many shayateen are around us? So when we act like angels, then we are surrounded by them. And when we act like shaitan, we are surrounded by them. And he whispers into our hearts and our minds. So when we act like the shaitan, there are shayateen around us. When we act like the angels, there are angels around us. So, for example, in our house, we want to turn it into a place of worship. So angels are there, right? It's a place of baraka, prayer. Inviting the angels when we pray. Especially, you know, my dear sisters, if you're playing Salah alone at home, right? What happens? You feel there's no one with you? No, my dear sisters, there's an entire row. You're certainly not alone. Angels to the right, angels to the left, the size of the mountain behind you. It's mind-blowing. The khushu can increase so much even if you just think that there, that there are angels accompanying you. They are praying along with you. Subhan Rabbi Al-Allah. May Allah make us of those who increase in our khushu a lot 
especially when we come to know how effectively the angels are behind us. They are helping us to do our best, alhamdulillah, protecting us all the time. So these are the three wise moves that we can do this time. Now moving on, my dear sisters. Three practical tips as far as this Ramadan is concerned. And what are those three practical tips? Three practical tips or you can call them uh, three hijras. What is hijra? It means moving on, right? To a better state. So the very first hijra is from sin to righteousness, to good deeds. And to this, my dear sisters, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you are on the deen of your best friend. So one key that I want to provide you with is that check, reflect who your friends are. Who is my best friend? And what is she pulling me towards? Is she upon the deen? If she is upon the deen, that is what she is going to pull me towards. And my dear youngsters especially, and all of us, my dear sisters, you are, my dear, an average of five people you meet on a daily basis. So think, who do you meet every day? What's the level of their faith who you meet? These are the people who are influencing you. And I want to repeat that again, my dear sisters, especially for our youngsters. You are an average of the five people you meet on a daily basis. So think, reflect, retrospect, and there's still time to change. So this is the month of reformation. This is the month of transformation. You know, if you feel that your friends are not drawing you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's high time to change your friends. These are the people who are influencing you. So my dear sisters, on the day of judgment, like we said, like we just referred to the verse in the Quran, which said, I wish I had not met you. I wish the distance between us was that like of the East and the West, between the heavens and the earth. This is the desire on the day of judgment that people will have because of the wrong friendship, because of the evil companions. May Allah save us from all kinds of evil companions. Then we move on to the second hijra. So second practical tip is from procrastination to self-motivated mode. What is procrastination? And how do we get into a self-motivated mode? Procrastination, my dear sisters, is, you know, a reluctance to do things, dragging, delaying, lagging behind, loitering, dilly-dally, blameworthy, delay, via laziness or apathy. Uh, it could be due to lack of motivation or you're on an avoidance mode rather than a drive mode. We've got to be as Muslims on self-motivated mode, eager to do things, determined to do. Procrastination is, is, is the thief of time. It's the robber of, of time. Collar him. Instead, it could be precastination, doing three things much in advance. So, like the Prophet ﷺ also said, beware of time wasters. You know, the best of us are those who make the best use of time. So, procrastination is a thief of time. Grab him by the collar and restrain him. So, what, have, what, what is the policy that we got to have? We have to be on the drive mode. So, from procrastination to a self-motivated mode or a drive mode. 
and we know that procrastination is again a is a strongest weapon of the shaitan so we've got to mind ourselves the intelligent person the smart person the wise person realizes that every moment every unit every bit of sacrifice and pain and planning goes going out of your way for doing things going out of your comfort zone will translate into happiness joy and well being and contentment and tranquility and bliss in the future it's proportional it's proportional in exchange and similarly the opposite is also true every moment of laziness procrastination delay and excuses and time wasted will translate into a proportional unit of regret sadness and pain what you are today is a very accurate de depiction of what you what you what and who you shall be tomorrow right my dear sisters we take the example of abu bakar siddiq radhiyallahu taala an and imagine you know he was the first to accept islam first for immigration ready you know almost cried of out of happiness when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told him he invited so many people to islam imagine you know his state that early in the morning when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is asking just after fajr who is fasting today who's fed the poor who's attended the funeral this is just immediately after the fajr salah and yet he is ready and he is the one who's raising his hands and he's run almost all of that subhanallah and my dear sisters if we reflect upon our youth today and upon the umma and the youth allah has drowned us with the talents we have to be self inspired people we are the product of our decisions my dear sisters we have to live a life of vision a life of project building goal setting and high aspirations a life of proactivity and positivity which we learn the best example is that of abu bakar siddiq radhiyallahu taala an so my dear sisters the very wise hijra would be to move from procrastination to a self driven mode this ramadan and the 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 third and the last move is another practical tip to move from lavish to simple you know when we are speaking of capturing the mercy of allah subhanahu taala grabbing the rahma of allah subhanahu taala you know if we are to be if if someone is to ask you know how am i supposed to actually do this how am i supposed to practically do this let me tell you something which i learned from one of my teachers and they mentioned you know divide all the work of ramadan into three categories every action divided into three categories category 1 is if it can be dealt with after ramadan so first category is what can be deal with it after ramadan so postpone it second category is total nonsense throw it out of your system third is immediate attention which needs immediate attention right away do it so these are the three categories my dear sisters now how do we go about if we want to fall into the best category of fasting that is the elect of the elect the khawasul khawas especially talking from the angle from the point of view of ladies and women and girls usually usually sisters i hear a lot of guilt and sadness and anger and mixed feelings you know how come it's so difficult for us so much care taking so much expectations and then our own ibada is in question 
and for some it's not necessarily homemakers not necessarily you know into uh, cooking and a lot of caretaking because you know as mothers as sisters as wives at home we are the ones who have to take care of the children take care of the husbands take care of the entire household make sure that everybody is going for salah and congregation sending people for tarawih and tahajjud and all that and so on and so forth so it's not just the homemakers but i'm talking of anyone who has who has like too much in her plate even students for that matter there's a lot of frustration anger guilt and of course especially there's too much where there's kitchen work is concerned so is it really all that work that you're doing or is it something that you have called upon it yourselves what about the so lavish avatars and after that the feeling of helplessness tiredness fatigue it's so common so try this formula my dear sisters and check if it works you know it's usually succumbing to the cultural expectations that makes no sense massive ramadan aftars okay okay i understand feeding people is a blessing and a rewarding but wait a minute the hadith what does it say it's breaking the fast of the person who fast so how do we break the fast especially people who have everything at on their on the table right what we need to break the fast a date a glass of milk pure water or maybe you know a plate of fruits but what about the massive lavish avatars the extravaganza that runs around imagine the efforts that went in right from the planning to the groceries uh, you know getting everything ready cooking and cleaning and cooking and cleaning and cooking and cleaning some make it so much care that it has to be so impressive for the guests so much effort into all this allahu akbar that literally literally you know some have forgotten to pray their salah some have forgotten to you know literally pray their fard salah and and it's so obvious that after all this entire thing you can hardly stand up for qiyam let go of the fard of the fard just for a sunna and what happens when the guest go my dear sisters what's left behind i i can imagine the mess to clean right and you are so tired that it literally keeps you tired for the next 4 days if you have five such aftar parties in ramadan half of ramadan is gone and for those who have more than that the entire month is gone but some say no i have to do it because it's my in laws my relatives it's i can't you know i can't i can't skip that okay okay my dear sister if you have to do it do the bare minimum point number 1 do the bare minimum okay relatives in laws it's okay i understand but what about friends why friends why we have to go out of out of the way somewhere something has to we have to draw that line right point number 2 knock some wisdom into the heads educate some wisdom my dear sisters some things can be postponed say postpone uh, you know all i will do in the uh, uh, one can say i can do all that in the six fast of shawwal that's how we'll we'll encourage them to fast the six shawwal or call them before and throw a big feast before ramadan begins if you must do it or call for eid eid is a time for enjoying eating celebration eat drink skip run enjoy so that's the way we honor eid even better it's insane sisters pulling out the recipes out of nowhere in the month of ramadan literally recipes that don't come out except for ramadan frying and cooking and baking old and new recipes as if you had no other time for experimenting new recipes allahu akbar this is truly insane 
this is nonsense figure out the bare minimum what you need to do my dear sisters even if you and i have to do it as a duty and then leave for tarawi invite them also for tarawi the problem is the problem of extravagant avatars you know elaborate sumptuously rich avatars and then you know we 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 can't even imagine it's so heartbreaking the amount of wastes allah hu akbar and there are so many people dying they do not have food and drink to eat and here those who have they waste over waste so remember we make it more difficult upon ourselves than what it needs to be and my dear sisters i'm not being spiteful don't we don't need to be spiteful rather creatively sort out the issue ramadan uh, uh, you know one can think of ramadan meal swap maybe five or six families and or, and or relatives can do it once a week so you get five days break you know you prepare for five other people and then you share it instead of everybody preparing for everyone and sending to all the relatives and all the neighbors ya rab sometimes neighbors give and we give them back then if not up to the mark criticism follows competition follows auzu billah i'll make this better and i'll give it to her tomorrow auzu billah so the next day you need to add more work because you got to return the plate so more time more effort more creativity to make it better imagine what's happening to the kids who are watching the moms in the kitchen so creatively occupied in the entire month of ramadan they too carry on the same legacy and proudly done so in the garb of a sunna while neglecting so many other important sunnas imagine my dear sister if one was to ask the little child you know the 5 year old what do you think your mom does in ramadan what would your daughter say or what would your son say if somebody was to ask my mom is involved in the kitchen because there's so much we need for iftar or would your daughter say my mom is connected to the quran i see her most of the time you know standing up for salah and reading the quran and doing something which is good right we need to reflect by dear sisters what is it that our children will want to continue you know what what is it what what will the child say and and if the child really says my mom is i see her in the kitchen all the time in ramadan wow what a legacy to leave behind and we have reached such extremes that we need to come back to you know the one meal challenge just one dish challenge and my dear sisters usually men do say maybe they say some of the men are very particular they need so many starters so many dishes you talk to your husband you talk to your family before ramadan begins and tell see even i want to do my ibada how about we confining ourselves to a simpler uh, iftar this time i would really plead to you my dear husband and allah will reward you for this i'm sure you know if you're going to have a way to convey it inshallah inshallah even the men will understand that if they if they are approached in the right way and of course the most important time is coming now at least for the last 15 days the remaining 20 days if not that at least for the last 10 days and the worst of the things that we can do is that we take out the cleaning and the white washing and shopping the last 10 days auzu billah because eid preparation is there that's the most crucial period my dear sisters inshallah we are going to come we are going to cover the lailatul qadr aspect in the in the upcoming sessions so my dear sisters be aware this is the technique of the shaitan shaitan wants to keep us distracted so if not music and movies he's got us hooked on to lavish iftar parties so mind you we should not succumb to the temptation of the shaitan and may allah keep us wise so that we are smart enough to make the best in this blessed month and we don't get carried away by the whispers of the shaitan and we keep ourselves 
and our fortress very very strong so strong that inshallah you know we emerge out of this boot camp with purified and pure hearts and minds and with nafs mutmainna wa qulu qawli hadha inna hu astaghfirullah wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum inna hu ghafurur rahim over to uh, sister liana for a quick round of q and a Jazakallah khair, Ustazah, for the beneficial sessions. May Allah grant us ease in transforming ourselves to be better this Ramadan and to continue with our reformed self even after Ramadan. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will go straight to the questions. Um, we have a, a few questions coming up. Um, the first question is... Um, how does a woman, especially housewife, strive to be sabikun? Yeah, how how does a, a housewife strive to be sabiku? Of course, my dear sister, the more the the level of responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put on her, but her opportunities are also so many. If she strives, if she if she struggles to do uh, whatever she can from whatever time she has, inshallah, inshallah, she can be amongst the sabikun. It's uh, um, it's not difficult for her if she has the intentions while she's doing all the acts of her physical work, you know, which which keeps her mind free. Throughout, she can be occupied with the vicar. If she has children, obviously, you know, this the, the taking care of the children and the nurturing them and the training of the children is going to be so rewarding for her. Paradise lies at the feet of the mother. So... If she lives up to the expectation what Allah wants her to be, inshallah, inshallah, it's not, she can be amongst the foreigners to Jannah, inshallah. Where the duties and the responsibilities are there, Allah rewards her also as much. Paradise doesn't lie at the feet of the father. So, you know, that honor is given to the mother, subhanallah. So, we need to understand and understand the gender roles that that Islam has clearly defined. If we uh, if we study Islam, you know, in fact, uh, women is honored so much in Islam. The rights of the woman are far more superior. Alhamdulillah, and that is why that is the reason you know uh, so many of the uh, women in the West are accepting Islam, right? Because they find Islam so practical. They find Islam honoring the women. And that's the reason, even if you compare the number of men and women, it's the, num it's the uh, females, more of the females are accepting Islam because they are happy with the kind of the rights that Islam gives to women. So coming back to your question, uh, it, is, it, it may seem difficult, but if she can wisely uh, take care of her time, and smartly plan her day and her activities, inshallah, inshallah, uh, Allah will make it easy. And, and above all, you know, intentions matter. If, her, if at the end of the day, after doing everything for the children and the home, if she has little time for her own ibadah, yet Allah knows in his divine wisdom her intentions. Her intentions are to serve Allah even through that serving. Allah will bring out the best amongst her children. Allah will give the best to her. In fact, if, you know, if she can raise those children, maybe from amongst them, there'll be leaders and muttaqeen. And the best of the best, uh, you know, will, uh, the ummah will be gifted with the best of the leaders who will be, uh, you know, the role models of the ummah. So it's not just what she is doing. The legacy that she is leaving behind is also important. So it's her vision. It's her goal. It's what she has. It's the purpose that she has. If she has a strong sense of purpose, inshallah, inshallah, Allah will uh, 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 show her her fruits in her life as well as later on, inshallah. So hope that helps. Thank you, Sada. Uh, the next yes, question... Sir will be a question about a few questions about Tarawih, which I will uh, just put it in one one 
questions yeah. all um, the uh, sorry liana mm-hmm. all the fake questions you know i have posted it on the group and uh, uh, the the questions relating to fake or jurisprudence they are all available the answers to that are available on islam qa one can refer to that depending upon which madhab you want to follow or uh, uh, you know you can you can uh, find the answers to that and i have also posted some of the questions and answers on the group uh, but there, if there is anything pertaining to today's topic you can ask my dear sister uh, okay so I'll, i'll move on to other questions instead um how to make a child comfortable with fasting uh, especially if the country's fasting period is long yeah that's a good question if the country's fasting period is long you know uh, the thing is that uh, if the child is uh, motivated well you know we uh, we uh, uh, i remember in the islamic international school we used to have three and a half year old children fasting you know uh it, it it and some of them did it for the entire month so three and a half year old four year old children can fast if they are rightly motivated uh, so that you know the, the the habit of fasting develops it's not a fard upon them but right from the beginning you know because when children generally like to imitate they like to emulate you know whatever they see the parents and the elder siblings doing they also want to do it so if uh one can explain to them one can guide them and in an environment which is uh, uh, you know a very ramadan friendly environment because children uh, you know uh, need to be given the right kind of uh, uh, the right kind of uh, ambiance especially in ramadan you know they need to learn about the sacredness of the month through being taught and shown its significance uh, uh, and this uh, is very important not just by the mere decoration or you know the mere uh, 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 what you say the the uh, the dazzling display of uh, aesthetic uh, you know uh, decoration in ramadan rather it's important that they are taught the true spirit of ramadan why ramadan comes if that is done because i remember as children you know we were also excited to fast to compete with each other in ibada to copy the adults to eat from the iftar foods you know that that's of course ironical uh, to go for tarawi and pray uh, uh, tahajjud also and and we used to be mostly excited for the right reasons right so if that is uh, explained in the right way inshallah it will go a long way but if ramadan to the adults in the family it's it's like a it's not like a welcoming factor and it's like a very tiresome thing and if the entire day if the children see the parents themselves so tired and so drained and not really agile and alert and wanting to do things and active then obviously you know they are going to feel oh fasting is something that makes one so tired like our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that we have to be we have to do everything and be smiling and happy you see even as fasting people throughout the day so if that is what the children notice inshallah that's that's what they are going to pick up from us and besides that uh, you know generally also for very small children there can be rewards uh you know children who do 10 fast children who do 20 fast children children who entire the fast the entire month can be given different rewards children who do qiyam who attend all the tarawi can be given a, a, a special reward so on eid day all these awards all these gifts can be given uh, which will be a source of motivation also sometimes you can also have a children's get together the first time one child fasts in the family you can encourage the child by calling all the fellow uh, classmates or friends and and you know throw up a little iftar wherein you can have a little quiz where you entertain the children 
some recitation of the Quran can be done. That is how it can encourage the children. Also, there could be awards for those who complete the entire Quran with reflection and understanding. Then, uh, you know, those for those children, uh, rewards and gifts for those children who uh, have been regular with their salah, if they're still not regular with the five times salah. So in, in the month of Ramadan, you have different categories of uh, rewards or gifts to, to the children. This will also help uh, healthy competition among siblings. Or if you have a you know larger family, extended family, so an entire WhatsApp group can be there encouraging, you know, who are the little ones who passed it today can send a thumbs up on the group. So that will encourage them, inshallah. I hope that helps, sister. Last okay. question now, my dear sister Liana. Okay. Um, all right. Um, someone asked if you could tell us what is your daily iftar routine, uh, the, the ideal idea of iftar, and also how to make a dua list. This is in one one person's question. Okay. Okay. That, that, that's a very personal thing, subhanAllah. Uh, right now, uh, I'm alone. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm just with me and Rateba. So uh, you're in Malaysia. So we are... Uh, Usually what we do is that before the Adhan, uh, we uh, around half an hour to around 40 minutes, if it's possible, or at least 20 minutes, uh, we do our own personal duas just before the Aftar time. And if sparing an hour, that's the best. But most of the times it does get difficult. And after that, as soon as the Adhan is called out uh, with dates and water, we break our fast. And we stand for the Maghrib Salah. And after Salah, we usually have some light fruits, uh, 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 a plate of fruits maybe, uh, along with uh, one meal that is some one thing that is prepared. Any one uh, item which is prepared, which is cooked, but not very often uh, um, cooked also. Usually it's like... Uh, maybe once in three, four days or something. I remember since the time Ramadan began, uh, there's already so much barakallahu fikum from the, uh, in the fridge itself, what was prepared earlier and some quick, you know, uh, thing which is done, which we can make, we make it quickly and, and we eat that. So, which, which doesn't consume a lot of time. Usually it's like just half an hour, maybe max including suhoor and aftar cooking time because uh, suhoor is also just make quick eggs and oats at times. Yeah. So that's how uh, it's a very uh, easy going thing uh, on the mind and the heart and uh, especially above all on the heart. And it's very easy to stand up for uh, Kiyam, Taravi, Tahajjud and doesn't make one sleepy also. So, yeah. And there was one question, my dear sister, uh, which I just read, which popped up here, was that can we hold the musaf in our hands uh, for qiyam, for taravi, tahajjud, or whatever, like to stand up in the night when we stand up for salah alone at home? Yes, my dear sister, you can very well hold the musaf in your hand and you can recite. If musaf is difficult and heavy for you, you can also hold, hold the uh, Quran app in your phone. Uh, I have a, a, a very interesting uh, set of uh, Quran, which I'm sure you get it in Malaysia also, because I had heard that this is available in Malaysia. Uh, this is, of course, available in India. It is a uh, single, single para, single, single juz, along with the translation on the side and below, which, which, so it's very easy to hold it in your hand. Even if you don't want to hold the phone, this is even more easier because it's light for the hand. You can hold it and just keep it in your hand while you, while you go in the ruku and the sujood. So that makes things uh, even more, uh, you know, easy. Uh, so hope that helps, my dear sisters. May Allah help us to make the most of uh, this, uh, the remaining part of Ramadan. May the uh, upcoming days be even more blessed for all of us wherein we can make the maximum time reflecting upon the Quran, maximum time we can stand up in Salah, maximum time we can put in, you know, with less food, less sleep and less drinks, inshallah. And so that we can be 
uh, uh, you know, the links of uh, drawing people closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sending gentle reminders who can bring people closer to Quran. Uh, Ameen, Ya Rabbul Alameen. May Allah make us of those who are most beloved to Him. Ameen, Suma Ameen. Jazakillahu khairan, kasiran, kasira. Hoping to see you all, all next week, inshallah, with even more, uh, you know, vigor and strength and uh, even more stamina, speed and success. Grabbed even more baraka and rahma from his mercy. Barakallahu fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakilahu khaira and... Um... What a beautiful session we have today. All right, so uh, we will conclude here and uh, inshallah, uh, we will see you uh, all you sisters again inshallah next week or the next session. So to conclude, uh, subhanallah wa bihamdik, nashadu ala ilaha ila anta, nastaghfiruka wa atubu ilayt. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.